Hello Camille, good to see you. Hello, thank you for inviting me. Our pleasure, you're welcome. Salut Adam. Hello, hello. Okay, so um, we we will start uh, the session uh, uh, as uh, scheduled in the in the website. So uh, hello everyone, my, my name is Yannick Perez. I will be uh, your chairman today, uh, meaning that I will be here to um, basically to raise a couple of questions. Uh, usually the, the starting one if there is no other questions, uh, and I'm uh, very happy to. Uh, to share this session, uh, which is on a topic I, I really like, so um, I think we we are now to, now ready ready to start. So, Ange, can you uh, upload your uh, PowerPoint presentation, please? Yes, sure. And uh, as we are supposed to be four speakers in this session, uh, I uh, we, we will go for. Uh, 20 minutes max of uh, of PowerPoint presentation, and then we will have a, a room for discussion. I, is it fine for everyone? Yes. Okay, very good. So let's go for. Ange, you have the floor. Okay, thank you. Uh, does everybody see my presentation? Yes, perfectly clear. Okay, perfect. So. I mean to to begin. So thank you everyone for for coming here and uh, and uh, and uh, welcome everybody. So my name is Ange Blanchard uh, and with uh, my teammates uh, Pierre Marie Manac, Mel Barriek, and uh, Roman Maréchaux, we have worked uh, on the effects of uh, vehicle to grid in France and Germany in the context of uh, market coupling by uh, the horizon uh, twenty thirty five. So this work has been done um, in the context of uh, a, ma a master's degree held by the Ecole des Ponts and uh, EFP Energy Nouvelle. And so, uh, uh, so we're, to, we're going to, to talk about that so for the next 20 minutes. Um, so I'm going, not going to be long about the, the motivation of this work because as you already know, the European ambition for decades now is to create a, a common electric market, so like a copper plate like on the continent, and uh, this to, to enhance the decarbonization of the energy production and uses uh, for, for the, the European economy. But this, uh, this, uh, this trend um, creates some challenges. So for example, market design has to be rebuilt for, for some certain uh, uh, certain specification and the grid stability too is uh, a great challenge uh, because as you may know since the renewables uh, are not uh, controllable it's, it creates some some issues and as the NSOA said before and for, um, for some reports now um, one of the key things to, to enhance is the cross uh, section complementarities we can build between uh, between between sectors economic sectors and so the, the complementarities between the transport sector with the spread of EVs and the energy sector with uh, the spread of renewables uh, is uh, one of a kind, and it's what we we, we are looking for in this uh, in this work. Um, so just to to, to present um, what we have done in this work is so we have built an optimization model, uh, hour based of both uh, the French and the German electricity markets. And we have, uh, we have uh, built an interconnection between them uh, with the modeling of uh, EVs uh, spreading uh, at the horizon 2035. Uh, so I'm gonna first uh, present you the data and uh, some curves of, uh, of the demand side um, and the supply side for, for each country we, we have made. Uh, then we will focus a bit more on the EVs and interconnection lines um, uh, modeling to, to show you how, how do we have uh, uh, modeled this thing in, in the model. And then we'll discuss the results um, and, uh, and the, the, the limits of, uh, of this work. 
so to begin with, um, we we have uh, we have drawn the the energy demand curve of uh, both countries, so for France and for Germany. So what we have done is first to um, calibrate the model for the year 2019 with uh, NSOA transparency data, and uh, we have decided to um, to use uh, a, a net demand curve. Uh, which uh, I mean that that by that that we have uh, subtracted the the renewable production from the, the the pure demand side demand curve sorry of both country just to 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 have the remaining power which has to be fulfilled by controllable thermal plants uh, generation and so uh, we have selected three typical weeks of the year 2019. Uh, which are the what we call the black week uh, first. Uh, it's a week where uh, in full full winter um, in very hard conditions where there is no much uh, wind or sun but a lot of consumption. And so it's indeed a week where renewable production is uh, not very important and that where consumption is very important. So um, the system is very stressed. Uh, and then we have uh, we have uh, aggregated this week way with two other weeks more um, classical uh, in the sense that uh, there is um, an average production of renewables uh, which is uh, which is okay. Uh, during the second week, it's more like a windy condition, so you have lots of wind but not lots of sun. And in the third week, it's the opposite. And so we have aggreg aggregated these three weeks. Uh, so we have approximately 500 uh, time slices of uh, one hour um, with, uh, so with, uh, with, uh, with this net demand curves, net of renewable production, as I said before. So here you have uh, the German electricity demand uh, we have used, and we have the, the same uh, kind of, of curve for, for France. On the other side, for the supply side, uh, we have built uh, the merit order stairs for each country. Uh, so as you may know, the, the, the merit order uh, logical is uh, very simple. It's just to, uh, to create a, a hierarchy uh, between the, 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 the different power plants uh, we have in the, in, in the country. So here you have for Germany. Uh, so what you can see, the first uh, step is the nuclear power capacity of the country, and then we, we, we increase the capacity available uh, in function of uh, the, the marginal cost of production of them. Um, so we have this curve for Germany and for France uh, without renewable sources, because I, as I said before, uh, renewable uh, production uh, power plants are, have been uh, uh, subtracted from the demand side and the demand curve. So we don't have to put it uh, in, the, in, the, in the merit order uh, figures, but uh, uh, indeed uh, they are taken into account in, in the in the in the model. Uh, then to talk about more um, mathematical stuff, uh, since our model is an optimization model, we have a function curve, uh, sorry, a cost curve, uh, a cost function to, to minimize. This cost function uh, is the sum uh, over all the time slices of the operational costs. So uh, the, 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 the variable cost we have when you produce one megawatt hour of energy, um, plus uh, some investment cost, because as I said before, our model uh, allowed uh, investment in uh, interconnection capacities and in uh, storage capacities too. Uh, so when I say storage capacities, uh, we're going to, to go further in it uh, on the next slide, it's just uh, conventional storage uh, capacities, so uh, pumped hydro storage, uh, compressed air uh, energy storage and uh, lithium ion batteries. Um, we have taken into account the CO2 costs from the EU ETS uh, market and uh, fuel cost, operational and maintenance costs for, for each type of, uh, of power plants for both countries. Um, so here you have the, the, the function that we, we try to minimize under constraints. The constraints are very typical, uh, mainly demand satisfaction uh, constraints. We, we want to have um, equality between production and consumption. And we have added some technical aspects, uh, more technical aspects like ramp up times, 
for each uh, technology, which can be different. You know, when you, you start up, um, when you want to increase the capacity of production of uh, some kind of thermal power plant, uh, it can take a bit of time uh, because uh, inertia is, uh, is at stake here. And uh, we have model uh, startup cost suit too, saying that uh, when you when you enhance when you uh, start up um, a specific power, power plant, uh, you have uh, you have some costs um, uh, added to the traditional operating and variable costs I showed you before. So this is the general mathematical structure of the model. Uh, we have calibrated this uh, for the year 2019, as I said before. So here you have just to illustrate what I say, the, the different uh, supply um, curves, uh, load curves of both countries for 2019, Germany and France. Uh, so it's not very surprising, but you, you can just uh, notice that in France, you have a lot of nuclear generation. In Germany, a bit of nuclear gen generation remaining in, in 2019, but a lot of coal power plants uh, uh, that are running all the time. Um, and you can see too the, the fact that in the first week, which is the black week, uh, you have in Germany lots of uh, production by uh, gas and, uh, and coal because renewables are not uh, running, as I said. Uh, and so you have a lot of uh, CO2 emissions, where in France you have nuclear uh, and a bit of, of gas, but not so much coal. So uh, let's have a, a focus on uh, conventional storage devices because as I said, the model can invest in them. Um, here you have the initial conditions in 2019 for both France and Germany. Uh, what you can see is that um, conventional storage devices are mainly uh, pumped hydro storage for both, uh, both countries. Uh, and so the model which were at the, at the beginning uh, a pure linear, linear model is now a mixed integral programming model because uh, we have to use binary variables to model uh, charge and discharge of these devices. Uh, and yeah, so the model can invest in both uh, pump hydro uh, storage, uh, compressed air storage, lithium ion batteries uh, with both capex and the respective capex and, and opex. So now let's be more specific on uh, electric vehicles and interconnection lines because it is what is at stake in our study. So for electric vehicles, uh, the idea in our work has been to uh, put them uh, exogenously in the model saying that in 2035, uh, the amount of electric vehicles will be uh, of about uh, 10 million units in uh, each country. Um, we have uh, modeled the energy consumption of this uh, vehicle park uh, in a bottom-up like approach, saying that each vehicle has an average uh, consumption per kilometer and, per, and an average uh, uh, use per day. So you have an average uh, amount of energy which is needed for, for this uh, vehicle uh, uh, park. And so, um, yeah, and so we have aggregated this, uh, uh, this, uh, this energy demand in uh, uh, one fleet of electric vehicles. Um, one key assumption in our modeling is really, really important is the, the load curve, uh, which is left uh, completely free. Uh, so it's really not representative of the, 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 the current and the actual use of electric vehicles by users, but it's more representative of uh, an upper bound limit uh, of uh, what we, we, we can have in uh, terms of uh, uh, impact uh, in, in, the, in the electric system. Uh, I, when I mean an upper bound is that uh, you have an upper bound in optimization. So you here the model that we, we use um, is really um, underestimating the impact of electric vehicles in the system. Uh, and so one of the key assumptions is that uh, we have left 20% uh, of the battery's capacities usable by TSOs in, uh, in order to modelize this vehicle-to-grid um, um, strategy and the possibility. Uh, to talk about interconnection capacities, uh, this modeling is, um, is more, uh, more, more, more simple. It's just that uh, for each time slice, uh, one variable is conserved, and this variable is the power, the total amount of power needed for both France and German uh, systems. So the sum of, uh, of the, the, the curves, the load curves of both countries. Uh, and so the model is let free to, um, to transfer a bit of the, the demand from one country to another, 
uh, but uh, constrained by the, 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 the capacity of the lines. And we haven't modeled the, the losses in this, uh, in this interconnection line. So now, now that I have uh, presented to you um, the model and the, and the data and the, the, the spirit, uh, we have uh, we have modeled the, the these and the interconnection interconnection lines and the, and the model. Let's talk about the, the results we have found. Here you have uh, some graphics of um, so of the model running for 2035 uh, with electric vehicles enabled and the storage capacities too for both Germany and France at the left. Uh, so what you can see is that uh, on the first week, you, you have in Germany a lot of uh, gas used because you don't have lots of uh, coal remaining in 2035 if, if everything is, is, uh, is, uh, is coherent with, uh, with the plans of the Fraunhofer and, and the national plans of, uh, of countries. Uh, so Germany uses a lot of coal, uh, a lot of gas, uh, sorry, to, to, uh, to, 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 to ensure um, production equals to consumption uh, because you don't have uh, renewable production, uh, because you don't have sun and, and, uh, and wind, uh, basically. Uh, then during the, so the following weeks, what you can see that uh, renewable production is uh, very important. And so we just have a bit of, uh, of, uh, of gas and, uh, and biomass remaining with uh, hydro too. Uh, in France, nuclear is uh, less uh, important than now in terms of, uh, of capacity, but still here. So you have this huge yellow bar uh, at the bottom of the, of the figure, which is providing uh, a cheap energy uh, to France and to Germany too, since you have interconnection capacities. Uh, because if we talk about quantitative results, when the model is left free, uh, you have an investment in, uh, in storage capacities, which is bounded because we have decided to bound the, the, the investment possible in, uh, in pumped hydro storage in order to model a bit more on the fact that uh, you have geographical constraints and acceptability constraints by the, by the population in these countries. And that in 2035, you won't be able to have, uh, I don't know, 15 gigawatt of, uh, of these technologies in both countries more than today. Um, but as you may see, the, the, in terms of, uh, of purely um, uh, linear programming uh, uh, theory, uh, since we have a bound, uh, we have uh, non-zero dual values, and these values are very important, being that, um, well, for the model, uh, investing in uh, pump hydro storage is uh, very interesting, and he wants to do more, but uh, he can't because uh, it's bounded, uh, both in France mm -hmm. and Germany. And, sorry, uh, Ange, sorry yeah. Ange, but you, you still have two minutes to conclude. Ah, okay. Um, or 20 okay. minutes. Um, and so the model tries to invest in, uh, in interconnection capacities. So about say 16 gigawatts, so it's big, uh, it's a very important uh, amount. Uh, interconnection, so here you have uh, the total cost of the, of the system normalized. And what you can see is that when you, you look at the, 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 the of the total, total cost of the system with uh, conventional storage is, is cheaper than without. And the EVs are like an intermediate case. Uh, if, you, if you add them, it's, uh, it's better than, uh, than if, you, uh, if you have not, in not conventional storage and not EVs, but it's, uh, it's uh, more expensive than if you have not uh, EVs. Uh, and it's very dependent on the interconnection capacity, as you may see, the, 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 the two lines crossed at about five gigawatts. And if we talk about uh, the relative cost difference between a case with and without vehicle to grid capacities, but with uh, EVs, uh, what you can see is that uh, vehicle to grid is really interesting in both cases. You already have um, reduction of costs, about 1% if you have no interconnection capacity between the two countries up to 4% when you have a lot of, uh, of interconnection. So this very, it's very interesting to see how uh, these flexibility devices are complementary uh, and that interconnection is at work. It's very, uh, we have to invest in them more, uh, but vehicle to grid and interconnection and uh, storage capacities are very complementary and have um, a very strong effects when they are combined together. And the spread of EVs 
have to be uh, followed by uh, this kind of uh, investment in the interconnection capacities, getting to grid uh, management and smart control. Uh, but just to say a final word about our study, uh, we have a very restrict uh, area of study because we only focused on Germany and France. So we had, it would be better if we, we could build a model of world Europe. Uh, the model is deterministic and clear-sighted, so it's a strong, uh, strong uh, limit too, because uh, renewables are stochastic, as you know. So uh, we don't, we haven't modeled that. And as I said before, EVs have been modeled in a very simplistic approach, and so it's the result we've shown is more like uh, a bound, another bound uh, of optimization that we can, but we could reach, but not, uh, not taking into account behaviors of uh, of users of electric vehicles. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Ange, for your very clear uh, presentation. Really, congratulations. Uh, it's very professional. Uh, Adam, I see that you raised your hand, so I assume that you have a question. Yes. Um, thank you very much for the presentation. Uh, it's it's uh, very interesting, and it's a topic that I also like very much. So I just have a technical question about the model. Um, I got, I'm a bit confused because um, you, you're like you mentioned that the model is considering uh, ramping. So I assume that it's also considering unit commitment constraints uh, in one of the slides. Yeah. For the one. powers. Yes. So you have the ramp up and you have the startup costs. So it must be a unit commitment model, no? Because otherwise you cannot calculate the ramp up and startup costs. What do you what do you mean by a commitment uh, model? So there is a um, um, a binary variable for the up and down of generation units, mm -hmm. right? Uh, no, um, because uh, uh, we have model uh, ramp up and ramp down uh, equally. So we just uh, look at the difference between um, you know the derivative in the, in the evolution of the power generation, and we apply to it um, costs a uh, ramp up uh, ramp up cost. We haven't um, uh, and and uh, a bound to the the, the to the, the derivative. So the, the this the ramp up uh, time is modeled like uh, uh, you can't you can't have uh, uh, an evolution of the of the um, yeah of the of the power more than uh, of uh, uh, three percent or five percent of the of um, of uh, of the power per minute or per per year per hour. It depends okay, on I see. The so it's yeah. an aggregated uh, estimation for for how Absolutely. much you can. Uh, so Absolutely. and and what is the time step that you're considering? The time step is uh, of one hour. Okay, so it's so it's, it's an hour and you step. aggregate. Uh, okay. Um, yeah. So it's a purely linear model, and this is why you're able to get a dual uh, for the for these constraints. Okay, this makes sense to me. And then, um, so my question. So so I, I I see that you mentioned some of the limitation, including the deterministic model, but I have an intuition. I don't know if you have done some sensitivity analysis about it. Um, about the selection of uh, the representative weeks that you have taken. I think mm -hmm. this will highly influence uh, your conclusions. I also, yeah. I don't know if you've done that. And I also think that um, the way you model the ramping is also a very, very like will impact, highly impact the conclusions of, of this work. I don't know if you've investigated this, like it's just an intuition. So maybe you already have some ideas. about. It. Okay. Uh, no, actually, we haven't investigated that uh, for the yeah for the, cho the, the choice of the the, the weeks we have uh, we have made like uh, show you your your right I think it has important uh, important uh, uh, consequences on the results we have tried to to use like typical weeks that represent the whole year but as you as you you said it's not purely representative we have uh, we have made some. Uh, uh, some statistical work uh, to see which week we, we, we could use, but uh, but no, we haven't done uh, sensitive sensitivity analysis on that and on the ramp up cost uh, either. Uh, we only have made sensitivity analysis on on some costs of uh, carbon costs or um, or um, or some uh, some cost of investment for certain technologies, uh, but not of that. No. Oh, but great, it's it's a great work. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you, Adam. Thank you. Um, is there any other questions for Ange? OK. Um, <clears throat> so um, a general comment uh, on the, um, 
on your hypothesis regarding uh, vehicle to grid, uh, you, you assume that there will be um, how many millions of, uh, of connected uh, smart cars in, uh, in 2035? Uh, so for for the um, we have assumed approximately 10 million uh, electric vehicles for uh, for each countries, um, okay. and so this is for the case where the model is left free to optimize as it wants, okay. and then during uh, sensitivity sensitivity analysis um, on uh, on interconnection capacities we have uh, built like an upper an upper case where you have you know. 15 million EVs, so it's very optimistic case where you have a lot of EVs, mm -hmm. and uh, mm -hmm. and we assume that there is a linear uh, interpolation between uh, the two curves of uh, the curve of conventional storage without EVs and the one with uh, 15 million EVs. So these two curves have, uh, are not crossing, you know, and so we assume that uh, for an, an intermediate case of uh, the spread of EVs, you will have a result which is uh, between the two curves. So, okay, and so my uh, my over comment, so my over question is: Did, did you consider uh, only personal cars, or did you also try to include uh, buses, trucks, um, any type of? Um, mm. EVs? Okay, yeah. So no, here we only have addressed uh, personal cars, but uh, the point you 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 yeah the, the point you say is very interesting actually this is one limitation of our work too but we we only have one uh, big fleet of electric vehicles but we haven't uh, we haven't uh, cut it into uh, into different uh, behaviors you can you can have for uh, because sure if it is an electric car for uh, for for domestic uses it's, it's not the same thing that if it is for personal uh, professional uh, uses and uh, usage and uh, so um, yeah we only have one fleet of electric vehicles and we don't say if it is uh, for professional or personal uses and if it is buses or ju just cars uh, but the idea was only to, to focus on uh, on cars and not on, on buses okay uh, thank you very much for uh, for your very clear answers is there any other questions so do we move to the second presentation Okay, no, thank you very much, Van. Um, thank you. Ange for, uh, for this uh, uh, very good presentation. And now we are going to move to uh, Christophe. So if you- Okay, I will share my screen. So you can, you can see my screen? Yes, it's working very well. Okay, perfect. Um, so my presentation is about the usage of, oh, I will switch on. I can't switch on the camera. Um, is about the usage of electric vehicles to balance uh, redispatch needs, which is um, done for Austria. So first of all, to the overview of my presentation, I will um, start with an introduction and motivation into the topic, followed uh, by the model formulation. It is split up into three parts, the aggregation model, a dispatch model, and uh, a redispatch. And finally, I will present to the results. Um, so redispatch measurements are of one of the main instruments of the energy market to prevent the congestion of transmission lines. And this is, done in uh, two or three steps. So first of all, in dispatch step, the optimal generation schedules for all thermal power plants, the usage of the storages and the renewable energies are planned based on the merit order function um, on the short run marginal costs of the devices. And within this dis dispatch step, the market clearing is done without, uh, without consideration of um, physical transmission line restrictions. So they haven't um, allocated any transfer capacities within a bidding zone, but only um, between bidding zones. And 
this may lead to congestions. Um, these are temporal overloads of transmission lines, um, which are encouraged by a growing share of the renewable energies, as well by the um, higher demand of electric cars. And if this occurs, um, redispatch measurements have to be carried out. Uh, which is done by a power increase and decrease of power plants. On, on the graphic on, on the right side, you can see the associated co costs to these um, measurements over the, over the past years. Um, you can see that they have been uh, risen uh, every year and probably will also do so in the future. So to this, uh, from a more technical perspective, these redispatch measurements are carried out on the instructions of the transmission system operator. So if a congestion occurs, um, one power plant on the one side of the congestion has to reduce its power, while on the other, other side of the congestion it had to, uh, to increase its power. So this is done for thermal power plants with, with a large uh, installed capacity of at least 15 megawatts. And this leads me to our research question. Um, we want to uh, investigate whether we can use the electric vehicles as a kind of demand side management system in combination with, with the uh, maybe containment of renewable energies to balance these redispatch needs, so to overcome the, the usage of, of thermal and so CO2 emitting uh, power plants. And what are the effects of, of, of this demand side management on the costs and on the CO2 emissions? So this is modeled in, in four steps. At the first step, we have to aggregate the model input data. Um, so all the, the single charging, charging processes of, of each car have to be, to be aggregated or summed up to like, uh, we call it charging types, charging types balancing group. Um, and also the balancing groups within Austria have to be aggregated to only uh, work with a market-based model without um, physical limitations within uh, the um, the country. So then in the, the first stop of the real optimization, the dispatch of all power plants um, is done. So all generation schedules are fixed. This is done based on the short run marginal costs and the merit order functions. The, the transmission lines within the bidding zones are not considered. So only them between the, the countries and some lines within Austria according to a slowest market coupling approach. So after this dispatch has been done, um, the balancing group uh, in Austria are disaggregated again. So now we have a detailed power plant distribution and a detailed transmission grid in, be in between, but the usage of the power plants um, stays unchanged. Um, it's, it's the same as from the dispatch step. And so now if a congestion occurs, um, redispatch measurements have to be carried out. So the objective in this step is to, to minimize these redispatch costs, um, to, to overcome the congestion. This can be done by the thermal power plant regulation, the uh, containment of renewable energies, and of course, uh, for the demand side management of the electrical vehicles. So the, the, the input of the charging profiles um, is done from a, statistical, um, from a statistical method. So on the left side, um, you can see um, the, a statistic of the uh, number of cars that are charging in a, in a specific hour. So all, all charging prof uh, profiles, all cars are split up into six user types. Each, each type of this, this car user has a specific time slot in, within each times uh, in, in that time slot. The energy demand of the car has to be compensated. For example, if you look at the red bar, the car is plugged in from 5 p.m. to 5 p.m. 
And in combination with some other statistical data from Austria, so each car drives 30,900 kilometers per year with a nominal charging power of 11 kilowatts. Um, this is um, this makes the, the real uh, model input and also the potential for the demand side management. So from in, in a mathematical way, uh, and the, the other equation is the summation of these charging charging types to um, charging types per balancing group. So the demand for, e for each node, the, the capital letter D is the model input uh, as I've shown it on the previous slide and the lower case Ds can be either decision variables or zero depending on the scenario. And of course, there have uh, have be some uh, there are some restrictions. So a car always should be completely charged when plugged off. Um, uh, it, so it doesn't depend if the demand side management is, due, uh, is used or not. So the this is the energy balance um, equation um, that says that the demand shift in a positive and negative way summed up should be zero, and this demand. Uh, set management is all is only possible while the uh, car is plug plugged in. This is done with the equations in the middle, which um, says that um, it can only be greater than zero if the demand input uh, is also greater than zero. So if the demand, um, so if the car is plugged in, and this is done before the optimization um, is started. And on the graphic, um, you can see that uh, in red, the model input from the previous slide and in uh, the blue box, the potential for demand set management following from, from this uh, model input with a maximum charging power of 22 uh, kilowatts. So now to the, to the dispatch, in the dispatch, the overall generation costs are minimized. Uh, by using the thermal power plants, the renewables, and the storages. This is done uh, within a rolling horizon model uh, with 365 um, steps. So the, minim uh, the objective is the minimization of these costs. The thermal generation costs um, consist of two parts. First of all, the, the generation cost itself um, based uh, with the short run marginal costs of each power plants. These consist of the fuel costs, maintenance costs, emission factor, efficiency, and CO2 price. And then there are some startup costs they have to pay it if a power plant starts to operate. Then there are maintenance costs for the actual generation of the uh, renewable energies. So the generation as a model input minus the containment and also maintenance cost for the turbine mode of storages. Then there is a not supplied energy. These are penalized with a very high price um, in this model, uh, 10,000 euros per megawatt hour. The main con constraint of this dispatch is the demand compensation. This is done now for every of the aggregated um, balancing group. So, and the dual variable of this of this equation gives the day ahead price for the specific node. And this day ahead price will be used la later on within the redispatch step to calculate the, the redispatch costs. Um, there are some, some more constraints for the thermal power plants and for the renewable energies. So there is only some examples like the technical minute maximum capacity as well as the ramp rate. And the renewables are calculated with a yearly profile with a one hour resolution. Um, also, the, the storages are, are limited uh, both in a technical way and by an annual pattern. This annual pattern has to be used since um, the optimization is solved day wise, but um, the storages should work in a year wise optimal way. And the exchanges are uh, uh, calculated with a power transfer distribution factor and by NTC limitations between the bidding zones. So after this dispatch has been done, 
Um, it is followed by, by the redispatch. So the redispatch costs have to be minimized now with a detailed power plant allocation within Austria and, and a detailed transmission grid. And with, uh, in, within this step, the demand side management function of the electric vehicles can be used. So the redispatch costs consist of two parts. There are costs for the thermal power plant usage, costs for the um, additional containment of renewable energies, and the demand side management of the cars does not lead to any additional costs. So the, the power um, increase of thermal power plants is associated with costs based on the maximum between the short run marginal costs and the day ahead clearing price and the containment of the renewables with um, the maximum between the day ahead clearing price and the assumed feed in tariff of 60 euros per megawatt. And if a thermal power plants um, has to decrease its power, this will lead to a refund based on the individual short run marginal costs. So, and the demand compensation um, has to be also considered again, but now all the, the, uh, all the variables that have been decision variables within this dispatch step are now uh, constant values. So, um, if a congestion would occur, it can only be done by regulating the, these redispatch variables. Um, and there is also one new equi equation, so the energy equilibrium um, that says that the power generation before the redispatch and after the redispatch has to be uh, has to be con constant. So the demand side management, um, demand increase plus the power plant. Uh, generation decrease and the renewable energy containment has to be equal to the demand side management demand decrease and the power, power plant increase. But this um, equation has to uh, only be valid within Austria. Um, otherwise the optimization uh, couldn't be solved anymore. And for the, all the other uh, countries and bidding zones, there is a more, more simple constraints um, saying that the thermal power plant generation has to be summed up the same before and um, after the redispatch. So for the following scenarios, um, all, all of the scenarios are um, working with um, the existing power plants, the renewable energy capacities, and the demand from the 2030 national transition scenario from the from the NCE. And there have been evaluated three different scenarios with um, three variants each. So the scenarios differ in the number of, of the cars that are used within Austria. Um, 200,000, 600,000, or 2 million uh, electric vehicles. And each of these scenarios is optimized in, in three ways. One without any demand side management option, then with the demand side management within the redispatch. And um, just as a comparison, what would happen if we use this demand side management um, already within the dispatch step? So these are the results um, for the 600,000 um, K scenario. Um, the bar, the bar plot shows the um, total energy that um, had to be used to, to balance this redispatch. Um, the negative, negative bars corresponds to, to a containment, uh, which is why um, so photovoltaic wind and run of river can only be found there and the positive positive bars are uh, power increase. So the upper uh, figure is without the demand set management option and the lower one with the demand set management within the redispatch. So this is dark, dark red or, or brown bars um, are the demand set management uh, potential that has been used um, in, the, in, the, in the redispatch. And um, it can be see, uh, seen if you, if you look at the, the yellow and the purple bars, so the PV and the wind generation, that the containment. Um, Five minutes. 
okay, um, has been has been reduced. And also, if you if you look at this light purple bars, the power generation um, of gas turbines could also be decreased with um, um, within the redispatch. Um, we'll skip this. Um, do the do the cost savings from um, from the overall system um, with without any demand side management. There are redispatch costs within a year of 130 million euros with, with um, demand side management of 121 million euros. So these are cost savings of about six uh, percent, and as, as you can see, a large part of the costs are incurred by thermal power plants and not by the renewable energy containment. Do the um, CO2 emissions um, caused by the redispatch? Um, yeah, you can see depending on the month, the emissions um, vary greatly. Um, this happens to uh, change in load, um, other renewable generation and storage usage. But um, you can say that the, the demand side management leads to uh, reduced CO2 emissions in each month. And summed up, these are 145 instead of 180 tons, uh, kilotons CO2 emissions. So approximately 20% uh, less emissions within the redispatch step. And also the negative pass in uh, June and December indicate that it, it was possible with the demand side management to completely prevent the startup of CO2 emitting power plants. And finally, the, the overview of, of all the results. So the, um, the upper figure are the redispatch costs, the lower figure are the CO2 emissions. And um, the demand side management during the redispatch leads to a lower containment of the renewable energies um, and therefore to the lowest CO2 emissions in all these scenarios. The demand side management in the dispatch, on the other hand, um, may lead to more frequent congestions to the market-based charging behavior of the, of the cars, um, which has negative impacts on the emissions within, within the redispatch step, but with only a small number of electric cars um, assumed. So for the 200,000 case scenario, um, it would be the cost of uh, most cost-effective um, scenario but in all other ones also um, the demand side mentioned the redispatch is cheaper so um, it could be shown that there is a potential of the demand side management of this cast and that it can be used both for cost savings and uh, to reduce the co2 emissions so thank you i uh, i hope i'm in time <laughs> And now I'm looking forward to your questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Philip, for uh, this uh, very nice presentation. I was stuck in, uh, in your last slide with the, with the results. So, uh, so it's uh, it's very cool. I see that Philip has oh. raised his hand already, so you uh, you could uh, start the, the questioning, Philip. Super. Thank you very much, Christopher, for the great presentation and the nice study. Um, I have a clarification question regarding the redispatch. Um, so you're you're having Austria um, there, and you're modeling uh, with a flow-based approach within Austria. Are you also extending the flow-based approach to the Virtuous countries to the neighboring countries, or do you have then only the DC or NTC capacities? Um, yeah, uh, I thought about um, also doing the redispatch in the other countries. Um, um, it's more it's more a problem that um, to really uh, calculate these redispatch costs, um, we have to assume a, a very uh, detailed power plant allocation and a detailed transmission grid. So otherwise. Uh, I'm not sure if if the results would be um, would be more better. Mm. Uh, it's more about the approach. So um, 
uh, how is the interconnection to the other countries modeled then? I know within Austria it's the flow-based approach and uh, mm -hmm. there you have the most detail. Oh. Uh, but I'm just interested in uh, also, the um, connecting. No, it's, it, it's, it's done with a, a power transfer uh, distribution matrix. So it's yep. all with the, with the substance of, of all the transmission lines mm -hmm. and um, with the um, NTC capacity, capacity. I think I have somewhere a picture. So, mm -hmm. so this, is, this is the net. And the, the power transfer distribution matrix is, is calculated for all these, um, for all these uh, countries. Super, yes. Yes, thank you very much. The clarifies it. Okay, is there uh, other questions for um, Christoph Papers? No? Uh, then, um, if you, could, could you get back to your uh, concluding slide, please, uh, Christoph? Yeah. So um, this one. Okay. So <clears throat> uh, of course, the, your results are very, uh, very interesting and very attractive. So um, everybody wants to <laughs> to get a, a, a better, uh, not a better, but a, a good understanding of uh, of your your different scenarios. Um, and uh, I, I would like to to know why did you choose your three scenarios being uh, two hundred thousand, six hundred thousand, and two millions? Is it because it's uh, reasonable for uh, Austria, or is it? Um, yeah, it is. Uh, what, what yeah, are so. Behind? So the, the two million scenario is so it's it's the ultimate goal uh, in Austria for 2030. So it's it's the the perfect um, scenario um, that we say at the moment till 2030 we can have uh, these two million two million cars. Um, so and and this is uh, in this scenario it's also assumed that all the cars are uh, taking part within within this redispatch, and. So for the other scenarios, I simply split it up for the so for the 200 case scenario, I said that 10% of the cars are um, taking part within the redispatch, yeah, and 600k is yeah, the middle. Okay, uh, and um, okay, uh, so uh, uh, and what is the the stock of car in uh, in Austria? Um, in general, up a, a bit more than than four million overall. So it means that you assume that half of the um, half of the fleet would be uh, would be electric in the next uh, the next ten years. No, the half of them. Half of them, yes. Okay, because there are four to five million million cars, yeah. and as a two million of them are electric cars. Okay, and uh, for Austria, is it an optimistic or a pessimistic scenario? I uh, yeah, I think that the two million is a very optimistic scenario. Okay. 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 Thank you. Uh, is there other questions coming from uh, the audience? No. Okay. So. Uh, Thank you very much, Christoph, for this uh, very interesting uh, uh, presentation. Very clear and very interesting. So congrats. It's, uh, it's a very nice work. And we are now going to move to uh, Philippe's uh, presentation. Yep. So I think, Christoph, you should switch off your own. Can you see my presentation? I think. Not yet. Not yet? No, we still have the Christoph ones. Sharing already, Nina. So now I think I've, I've stopped mine. Uh, okay, I, I would just uh, share again. Uh... 
So I still have the, the slides of the results. I don't know if I'm the only one. Uh, I'm definitely sharing right now. Okay. So. Uh, did it work? Time of, uh, the refreshment. Yeah, it, it's ah, working. Yeah. It's a big red screen. I think uh, yeah. if you can see it now, then uh, I would start. So yes, yes uh, let's go. Thank you. Uh, I'm Philip. I'm from the Technical University of Denmark. Uh, and I would like to present you the study I've been um, doing with Claire, Ida, and Fabian. Uh, and it's on the electric vehicle charging and its impact on energy system development and mitigation of CO2 within Europe. So to give you a quick context, as you all know, we have the Paris Agreement and the Green New Deal. And the main focus uh, of those two are actually the mitigation of uh, CO2 and greenhouse gas emissions uh, in the world and in Europe. Um, and one of the uh, main things which are required to achieve that is the rapid transition of the electricity sector, the heat sector, and transport sector, also the agriculture that comes in the middle. Um, but in order to achieve that, we need to increase the share of production of very, very renewable energies uh, quite a lot, such as solar and uh, wind power. And uh, this is particularly targeting the electricity sector and the heat sector. Uh, but at the tra uh, transport sector, uh, we also need to shift. And uh, in private transport, there's in particular the change towards uh, electric vehicles, which can utilize the uh, production by variable renewable energies. Um, those electric vehicles will bring enormous loads and therefore pressure on the system. Uh, they can increase peaks and uh, distort prices, but at the same time, they have a huge storage capacity, which has the potential to balance the variable renewable energy production. Uh, naturally, along comes uh, the uncertainty, which comes with uh, electric vehicles due to the, the human factor in, in uh, the usage of the electric vehicles. And further, and even more important, the charging scheme plays a crucial role. So the way how we integrate those electric vehicles into the system. So uh, embedded in that and in the green transition in Europe, uh, my research question was, um, what is the impact of EV integration strategies on the European energy system? And with EV integration strategies, uh, I'm particularly meaning passive charging, smart charging or vehicle to grid charging. So whatever we are incentivizing most, uh, um, and what kind of effect those uh, charging schemes have. And my study has a focus thereby on uh, the integration of variable renewable energies into the uh, electricity system, the electricity price variations, so fluctuations, and um, uh, the mitigation, obviously, of greenhouse gas emissions, since uh, this is the main goal of the Green New Deal and Paris Agreement. Uh, those Kind of studies are not uh, particularly new, but um, we try to incorporate some additional novelty, uh, which is not uh, covered by literature as much. So at first we develop a robust integration strategy of the uh, EV, including to a certain degree um, uncertainty to the best possible degree in deterministic models, so to speak. Um, we are tackling the overrepresentation of EV availability, which is currently present in uh, literature when they are modeling energy system development with EVs. Um, we are therefore also more accurately accounting for the energy balance and the charging potential, which is um, tightly connected to the availability of electric vehicles. We are including EV battery degradation as a cost function and uh, therefore limiting um, the battery aging uh, of the electric vehicles and uh, tackling critics based on that. And in the end, to put everything into uh, perspective, we are also comparing the EV flexibility and its impact with um, a scenario on uh, transmission system expansion. So to put EV flexibility uh, and their impact, positive impact in comparison with uh, uh, possible transmission system expansion. Um, now, how we are representing the electric vehicles, we are focusing only on home charging, so private electric vehicles on home charging. Um, we are uh, using the Danish National Transport Survey, uh, which has a pool of 86,000 uh, individual driving pattern, and uh, use those to, um, in a Monte Carlo-like simulation, um, to build driving pattern of single vehicles. So, uh, in the beginning, we are simulating 
uh, single vehicles and their yearly driving pattern for every single day and hour. Um, with that, we are also combining certain uh, restrictions on those single vehicles, uh, for example, the state of charge goals, uh, for example, in the morning, uh, where we are saying, okay, every single vehicle has to be charged in the morning, if one hour before um, the earliest time they would leave uh, with 100% of the uh, battery capacity. Um, further, we are also limiting the flexibility by saying, um, every single vehicle has a certain probability of leaving between six and let's say nine or 10. Uh, and in those hours where there is a probability of leaving, we are not allowing for any flexibility service because we want the vehicle to be charged 100% when uh, the EV owner wants to leave. Um, we also have partial forced charging after arrival. So when vehicles come back from a trip and their state of charge is lower than a minimum emergency um, yeah, energy, requirement in order to get to the nearest hospital, we are forcing charging immediately. So no flexibility there. Uh, this could be represented here by the blue bars in the graph. So when a, when a vehicle comes back, um, they might have to charge. We also have the uh, um, flexible and um, uh, over the day changing uh, state of charge constraints dependent on the availability of the vehicles and the entire fleet. So. Uh, we can only serve a certain flexibility based on a lower and an upper um, state of charge. Um, as before and already mentioned, we have this uh, cycle degradation and calendar battery degradation um, cost implemented. So the cycle degradation limits the charging power. So we have an additional cost uh, for uh, aging of the cell when we are charging too, too strong. And further, calendar battery aging because if we have a very high state of charge, the battery also ages much quicker. And then obviously also we have a, an additional cost for the charger implemented, dependent on if it's a normal unidirectional charger, which is good for passive charging and uh, smart charging, or a higher cost for bidirectional charging. So we, if we can charge and discharge the vehicle. And coming from this uh, single vehicle view, in the end, we are aggregating all those single vehicles with their specific constraints uh, based on their driving pattern uh, to an aggregated virtual storage in order to reduce the amount of variables and constraints we have to implement in our energy system model. And this energy system model is called Balmoral. Uh, it is uh, hourly based uh, investment model. Um, and we are mainly modeling part of uh, uh, Central Northwest Europe and Scandinavia and the Baltics, seen here on the right hand side. Um, we are modeling a pathway. So, uh, in an annualized way, we have 2020, 2030, 2040, and 2050. Um, we are modeling the electricity sector, the district heating sector, the private uh, transport with our uh, electric vehicles. We have the CO2 prices, which are increasing over time until uh, 2050 with 130 euros per ton CO2. Well, additionally, we also enforcing carbon neutrality in 2050, um, which has to be achieved. Um, the uh, transmission system is based on the 10 year network development plan in 2030 uh, by NCOE. Uh, and it is modeled via flow-based model, uh, via, via the flow-based modeling approach. And then we have um, the previously mentioned three charging schemes, passive charging, smart charging, vehicle to grid. In most countries, we uh, assume that 50% of the entire fleet is mainly doing home charging in an electrified manner uh, in 2050. However, there are also countries uh, where there are additional studies which helped us to uh, update this assumption, for example, for Norway, where we can assume a much higher share and also in the Netherlands. So wherever it's possible, we uh, based our assumptions on uh, studies that, that are available. Um, and in the end, we are comparing those different uh, charging schemes also with and without network expansion plans. So um, either we have a fixed uh, transmission system, which cannot be changed, or uh, we allow for expansion, which is starting from 2030, 2014, uh, 2050. So in the end, we have uh, those scenarios, first the three charging scenarios over here, 
and they are mixed with uh, the transmission expansion plans. So in the end, we end up with six different scenarios, which we are investigating. Uh, it's all running on, a, on an HPC cluster with 10 CPUs and 100 gigabyte of uh, RAM. And it takes around 24 hours to optimize the system. Jumping into the results, uh, at first, I would like to show you uh, the coverage of electricity production by technology from 2020 to 2050 with passive charging and a fixed transmission system. So this is the base base case. And here we can see, I hope, I hope you can see also my mouse, um, uh, we can already say that around 52% of uh, the electricity production is covered by available renewable energy, such as solar and wind. Uh, the next um, most important technology is uh, nuclear power, mainly due to uh, France and Finland and Sweden, which maintain part of their um, capacity there. Then hydropower and a little bit of uh, biomass. Um, when we look in the transition, uh, we see that here in pink and in red, uh, a coal power plants here, just a normal thermal power plant, and here is CHP. Uh, are reduced into 2030 quite drastically, a little bit taken up by CHP gas power, um, and then that is also phased out to 2050. Um, next comes uh, passive charging with um, uh, transmission expansion, with endogenous transmission expansion. Um, I will flip a little bit back and forth to make it more clear where the difference is, because there are actually just two small differences. Uh, when you look well, when you look a little bit here with the wind, when we increase the transmission expansion, we are increasing the blue area, so the wind capacity. So transmission expansion increases the share of, uh, in particular, cheap offshore wind. Uh, and the second part is when we increase the transmission expansion, uh, then we are reducing here in gray the capacity which is used in uh, CHP gas. So this is the effect of transmission expansion when we have passive charging. Now we want to jump into uh, the actual interesting part with um, the flexibility of EVs. Uh, here we have uh, the absolute differences um, in energy produ electricity production uh, compared to passive charging with a fixed transmission system. And we're uh, comparing it to smart charging here and vehicle to grid. And the main outcomes here are in particular the wind power. So as we saw similarly before, transmission system expansion helps wind. And we see exactly the same when we only increase the flexibility by EV. So we, we increase the amount of uh, wind in the system. And that is to the expense of solar PV mainly, and also gas power plants over here. Um, furthermore, we saw that uh, the more flexible the EVs are, um, the more competition exists to other um, uh, electricity to X technologies, such as power to heat. Um, so with more flexible EV, we saw that the business case for uh, heat pumps and district heating was actually um, uh, worsened. And furthermore, uh, we also saw that with more flexible EV, we significantly reduced the amount of stationary battery, the uh, stationary uh, battery that are being installed and used. So the EV flexibility actively reduces uh, the uh, installations of stationary batteries. When we look into the same picture, just with the endogenous uh, transmission ex system expansion, we see a completely similar picture. Um, we are increasing the amount of uh, wind power in the system at the expense of uh, solar PV and even more uh, peak power capacity by gas power plants like gas CHP. Um, also, similarly as before, um, with more EV flexibility, we are diminishing the business case of uh, heat pumps. At the same time, when we are comparing uh, passive charging with a fixed transmission system and passive charging with, a, uh, with an endogenous um, transmission expansion, we saw that actually batteries, stationary batteries, are not that much impacted by a transmission expansion uh, while the EV flexibility, flexibility directly impacts batteries as um, deployment in the system. To summarize uh, all the previous uh, figures, we can achieve without a problem uh, carbon neutrality in 2050. 
uh, wind power and solar power will take the uh, major part in that, while gas power substitutes part of the coal until 2030, but then still remains marginal and uh, phases out until 2050. Um, flexible EV charging and transmission expansion leads to a substitution effect from PV to wind. And further, we see a uh, competition effect uh, from flexible EV that are limiting the business case of power to heat technologies and also batteries. Uh, jumping to the price fluctuations. So uh, usually we like to have very steady prices in order uh, to have better transparency and easier uh, approach in markets. So we are looking into standard deviations of electricity prices um, uh, for different charging schemes and uh, transmission expansion plans in 2050. So on the right hand side, I already uh, made the figures. So on the top, we see the three charging schemes and with a fixed transmission system. And later the lower three figures are, again, the charging schemes with an endogenous transmission system. So here we start with a fixed transmission, transmission system and we can see the more flexible we get from left to right, the greener the countries get. So since it's the standard deviation of prices, the more we re reduce the fluctuation of prices within the countries. So we can say EV flexibility reduces locally in the countries the price fluctuations. And now we compare it to uh, expanding the transmission system. And here, as well as before, from left to right, we are also increasing the, um, the EV flexibility. But at first, we can see here that when we have passive charging and the, an endogenous transmission system, um, we see that yeah, the transmission expansion actually smoothens prices and price fluctuations uh, on the spatial scale. So everywhere we are moving towards each other and balance out. But then if we increase the EV flexibility going from left to right, we can see that we are everywhere uh, reducing price fluctuations very, very well. So in the end, we can conclude that EV flexibility reduces significantly the prices, uh, price fluctuations locally over here, uh, while transmission expansion um, smoothens the prices uh, on spatial scale. And that is mainly due to the reduction in peak prices while low prices are getting pushed up. So we are just uh, reducing uh, basically the variance in standard deviation. And then overall, with this integration, we can see that there are distribution effects within Europe. Uh, coming to the one of the most important parts is the mitigation of emissions. And here we are comparing always the accumulated um, CO2 emissions uh, to the passive charging scheme. So the figures, figure captions are here. So we are comparing the absolute savings of smart charging compared to passive charging with fixed transmission and here with vehicle to grid. And here we do both again with endogenous transmission expansion. As before, um, the more flexible we get from left to right with electric vehicles, the more we can save up to 9.5 9 million tons of CO2. Uh, but we see a different picture because the technologies which are installed in the countries are uh, different. For example, uh, we see the most uh, savings in Germany and Poland. That is mostly because there we have uh, the most coal capacity and lignite capacity installed. So um, they can save quite a lot in the European context. However, a little bit at the expense of neighboring countries such as Denmark and uh, the Netherlands. And there's uh, a part of the reason is because Denmark and the Netherlands have high efficient um, CHP gas power plants. And basically with a higher uh, flexibility of EV, we can not only um, uh, increase the utilization of the um, wind, we are also improving the uh, utilization of interconnectors um, between the countries. So then we are using a little bit more of the CHP capacity uh, in the Netherlands and Denmark, and we are actually over increasing emissions in those two countries. But uh, with the high efficient uh, CHP plants there, uh, we can send the cleaner energy uh, towards Germany and Poland, and they can save much more. Um, when we have uh, the endogenous transmission expansion, uh, we have the same picture, just even more, uh, 
yeah, dominant. Uh, we can see that uh, Germany can save them the most and uh, Poland the next. Yep. You really have one minute to conclude. Perfect. I have only one and a half slides left. So yeah, basically flexibility of EV transmission expansion accelerates CO2 reduction. We have a better utilization of transmission lines with EV flexibility. Uh, we have uh, the main reduction of CO2 in the central countries uh, at the expense of the richest countries. And we have, again, distributional effects. Uh, last results uh, we have here, we have a cost reduction with a fixed transmission expansion compared to PC when we change to smart charging of around 3.1% and vehicle to grid 4%. Similarly, when you have an endogenous transmission system, uh, we can save 5.5% of costs uh, with vehicle to grid. Um, and when we have vehicle to grid with transmission expansion, so the best case versus uh, passive charging with a fixed expansion, um, then uh, we save around 7.2%. And that is mainly due to less battery storage that is required. So we actively reducing uh, mostly investment costs into uh, stationary batteries with more flexible EV. Um, the bet or the, the discussion about it is uh, mainly on the policy side. Uh, we have a regulatory framework uh, which hinders the extra flexibility that I was modeling here to shine through such as uh, uh, hard rules on aggregation, technical requirements on the SCADA systems and uh, minimum bit requirements, which will hinder that we can um, achieve those uh, outcomes. So that has to be changed. Um, we are not looking into stacked services such as frequency power control or uh, inertia services, which is a shortcoming in this study. Uh, we are also not looking into the management of the distribution system where we can have even a higher impact on local grids through congestion management and reactive power control. And we are not looking into human behavior. There's no temperature de uh, dependence and we are uncertain about battery and charger prices. So here I can uh, conclude hopefully very quickly. Um, uh, so flexible EV charging and transmission expansion leads to a substitution effect between PV and wind power. We have competition effect that uh, affects uh, power to heat in batteries when we have more flexible EV. Um, EVs are significantly reducing the uh, price fluctuations locally, while transmission expansion uh, smoothens price, prices on um, the spatial scale. Um, the flexibility of EV and transmission expansion accelerates both together the, the CO2 reductions. Uh, and this is mostly uh, happening in Poland and Germany at the expense partially in richest countries. So there we have, again, the uh, distributional effects, but those distributional effects uh, end up, up in an overall positive uh, effect, uh, which also then stresses that we have to do and we have to have European coordination uh, in order to achieve the least cost transition. And therefore, we have to put into place policy and increase the utilization of EV flexibility. Thank you. I hope I didn't over uh, took the time. Thank you very much. Very nice presentation. Uh, congratulations. Um, so Adam raises his hand for the first question. Uh, so please, Adam. Yes. Um, <clears throat> thank you very much, Philip. Uh, great presentation. Um, very comprehensive work. I have um, a couple of questions, if you don't mind. Mm -hmm. First is about one of uh, your first conclusions here is that you're talking about, so I think it's more of First of all, it's more of an observation from the, the analysis you've done, but I want to understand the point of view of making it um, a, a policy conclusion. Mm -hmm. uh, for the substitution effect from PV to wind power, why is this interesting? Like, why is it, would it be interesting to actually care about that we substitute PV to wind power? Um, it is uh, more an observation in that regards. Um, yeah. At the same time, um, uh, I mean, I have to put it into place. The You can see here the modeling area. We have more, mainly the North Sea and Baltic Sea area. So everything I'm saying is only valid for this environment over here. While when we have Italy, Spain, and so on, we will likely see uh, that there is uh, maybe a different uh, substitution. At the same time, um, uh, we can say that when policymakers want to um, uh, increase the amount of wind power production um, and also expand uh, in the offshore regions uh, the places where we can build those then we have to do something about the EV flexibility or the transmission system or both 
Um, otherwise, we will see that uh, solar power is much more important because when the EV flexibility is not supported by policy, we see that we need much more PV local production in order to cover uh, the local demand more accurately. Right, but so I, I understand it's more of an observation, but it's just an interesting observation that I would actually um, um, like. I, I when you dis when you discuss first the subs like the what happens in terms of um, the difference when you when you consider transmission extension and when you don't, like mm. yeah, I see the benefit of the reduction of the gas um, production or like. Mm coming from the gas uh, power plants. And I understand that actually, because I work on flexibility, I understand that you need these, uh, these units if you, if you don't have flexibility in your network. Mm. Um, from the point of view of policy, saying that if you have a, net a stronger network, then you can reduce your, uh, your need for flexible units such as gas, which emit a lot of more uh, energy, uh, like uh, carbon, sorry, and, and so on. Mm. Um, but the idea that there is an, ob like an observation from, from a shift from PV to wind power is actually interesting, but. I wonder if, if this had um, a particular point, but I see your point, like I see uh, your explanation. So maybe you can just ask another question about that. Yeah, it's not a policy recommendation per se. It's yeah, more it's more of an observation, yes. Yeah. I see. Um, the other question is regarding to the assumptions on EV charging behavior. Mm -hmm. So I wonder, because this is also, I just want to have your opinion on that um, mm -hmm. uh, in general, because like it seems to me, and, I, and correct me if I'm wrong, that usually what we do, even I, huh, we do that in, in research, we have like these ideal uh, assumptions about, okay, like if you integrate EV and you make them behave this way, mm. uh, will like the outcome will be like what you're showing, very good outcome, uh, very mm. positive, uh, you know, uh, uh, results and, and very good recommendations. But mm. my, my question is this ideal behavior um, needs to be incentivized somehow but also, and probably more importantly, what happens if we don't have this ideal behavior? Like maybe, maybe the opposite exactly would happen. No, maybe we will have more problems mm -hmm. other than better performance. So I just want to have your opinion. I'm not criticizing the study. I'm just like, I, I'm wondering because you worked on this in a very comprehensive way. So what, what's your take on that? Yes, uh, thank you very much for this question. I mean, it, it, it is so relevant. And um, actually in, in other studies where I'm also looking into actual charging uh, data in, in households, we can see that most people are actually just using passive charging for now. So um, there are different levels uh, where we have to take into account the human behavior. Um, uh, starting here from the more regional and national level, uh, actually, I believe that uh, the effects which are shown here are actually the lesser effects. So when we have optimal human behavior here with smart charging or vehicle to grid, um, we, we saw here some um, yeah, positive outcomes with regards to system costs and so on. Uh, I think that they're only uh, a smaller part. Um, so human behavior here uh, can have an impact, but it will be still limited. And But it's still important to incentivize that human behavior. And uh, we can even say, I mean, the human behavior here has to be towards please plug in your vehicle and please do flexible charging um so, sorry uh, guys but uh, we, we have to move to the to the next presentation yes we but have, i understand we, your point thank you very much philippe it's, uh, it's, so sorry adam sorry no. philippe and sorry remy and, and both peter but uh we still we we, we need to, to move forward to the, the last presentation uh, of Carlos, um, but if we have time at the end, you you could of course uh, raise your question again, um, no no problem. But we we need to move forward. Very sorry for that. So Carlos, could you upload your presentation, please? Hello. Okay, I, I'm gonna try to do that now. Um, Okay. okay, I am displaying. Can you see the, the, the slides? Perfect, thank you very much. So, well, I'm, I'm Carlos Gaete, um, uh, a researcher of the DIW Berlin. And uh, yeah, I'm going to present my, my results based on uh, electric vehicles. 
So um, the, the battery electric, electric vehicles is expected to increase in the coming years. And, and that may, may offer the possibility to, to increase, offer the possibility to, to, to increase the, the renewables integration in, in energy systems and at the same time decarbonize transportation. Um, there are multiple effects that uh, happen in power systems that are related on, for example, the increase of electricity demand and also, uh, but also the electric vehicle may offer a new source of flexibility by providing the storage to the system. Um, in this research, I would like to, to analyze the trade-off between the increase of electricity demand associated with the increase of electric vehicles in the, uh, in the, in the power system, or let's say in the, in the fleet. Um, and also the possibility of the flexibility. So my next slide. To make this uh, research, I base uh, in two tools, Imopi and DigitalPi. Actually, those two tools are the tools that we have developed. Um, the Imopi consists on generating time series of electric vehicles. And, as, and I'm gonna point here with my mouse, uh, the time series that the, the model the Imopi uh, creates our tool. Um, for example, mobility, which consists on the location of the different, uh, at different hours of the vehicle, the driving consumption, which is the energy consumption that, that provides the battery to the motor of the vehicle in order to, um, to enable the vehicle uh, the traction and also the, the heating. Uh, and so we also take into account here, for example, the temperature well. And then with, with those two time series, helps to provide information in order to generate the third time series, which is the charging availability. This charging availability consists on knowing the location and the energy consumption of the vehicle in different hours, and then uh, allocates charging station through the time series. And that charging, uh, charging station, uh, we have information, for example, of the uh, power rating uh, of every uh, uh, power uh, charging station. We have eventually the option to generate the grid uh, demand time series that it, uh, it looks into the energy consumption uh, due to the driving and also the location of the, the power station. So then when we set some kind of, um, some kind of uh, strategies, charging strategies, we call it exogenous uh, strategies because uh, are, are not based on power optimization, but just decision that the driver make. So in our analysis, we are gonna consider, for example, the, the immediate charge that consists of the vehicle after driving, as soon as it gets a charging station available, it charges at the maximum capacity. So that, that's why it's called, called the, the immediate charge. So the other tool that we also uh, use is the tool uh, DITER pipe, but actually is the, a power system model, which is called DITER, which runs in GAMS. Uh, our tools are open source. So if you want to see the equations and the constraint, I invite you to go to the to, to our repository and then you are gonna be able to see all the equations related on, on this power system model. Um, what we do with DitterPy is make a Python wrapper uh, and enables particularly to generate uh, scenarios, several scenarios run in parallel and, and, yeah, and then see the results and visualization of the results. So those are where the two tools that I have used in order to make uh, the analysis. In this particular research, what I have done is, um, is for example, modeling the exogenous battery electric vehicle. As you can see, we have developed 40 times three years of vehicles. Every time three represent one particular vehicle. And, and here we have the blue color, which represents the grid demand. So what we provide is the time series associated with the, the grid demand, what is the, the electricity drawn from the grid to charge the battery based on an exogenous uh, decision, in this case, the immediate charging. So providing this, uh, Dieter is able to identify the investment of different technologies and the dispatch of the technology. So the other com uh, configuration is that, for example, feature a uh, grid to vehicle. So in this case, what we provide is uh, again, the 40, um, Profiles, but in this case, what we provide are those two, which are related on the energy consumption for driving and the availability in the grid. So in that case, internally, teacher is able to determine the charging 
the smart charging, I call it, in this presentation, and also the uh, investment and dispatch of different technologies. And our third configuration is the vehicles to grid. And again, we present, uh, we provide to teacher the 40 time series, but in this case, we provide exactly the same, the uh, driving consumption and charging availability, but in this case, the teacher is able to provide the charging decisions and also the discharge decision that is the electricity uh, provided to, to the grid. And again, the investment decision and dispatch of the different technologies. So um, now I'm gonna present the assumptions and then we're gonna go directly to the results. And um, in the, here in the assumptions that we do for this particular uh, research is using Imopi, we, we generate the 40 time series uh, or 40 profile of electric vehicles considering the following. For example, the type of driver, in this case are two types of driver, drivers, and we consider non commuter which are usually free people with, uh, for example, pensioners that they can choose at different days what they, they are gonna do and with the destination they are gonna go. And then we have also the commuters. In the commuter, we have two kinds of commuters, which are worker people, and there are full-time and part-time workers. So it depends, it depends on this activity that the number of trips that the vehicle makes may vary. And the other consideration is the destination. Um, the destination we have considered six destinations, for example, which are related on mobility in Deutschland uh, uh, survey. And uh, it consists on home, shopping, leisure, store, errands, and workplace. And uh, as an example of the, the probability distribution that we use to generate our first time series, which is the mobility time series, uh, we have here the different graph for non commuter and for commuter. In the case of commuter, we have this color, which is the departure time, departure time uh, of uh, going to workplace. And usually after uh, at the end of the, of the day and through the day, also there are departure time associated with going to home back or back to home. Um, the other consideration is that we, we consider four models. Our tool takes into account several models, about 80 uh, models. In this case, we consider the, the models that are uh, sell most in Germany, which are more, uh, Tesla Model 3, uh, ID Volkswagen, Kona, and Tower. Uh, Considering that database, we we provide this, the, the the motor side, the power of the, the motor, the size of the battery, and all the information, the, the weight of the, the vehicle, the area that the faces the, the wind. So in order to determine the, the energy consumption, um, we have charging station and the garage and the power rating on the street, on workplace, and also we consider fast charging. And um, in the case of the charging strategy, as I have explained uh, now, uh, we, we consider the immediate charging. We have developed 40 profiles for this analysis. In the case of DITER, we have here some, some uh, data related on what our power system model does. Um, basically, it's a minimized the total system cost, and it determines a, a, a long run uh, first best equilibrium benchmark of frictionless market. And it takes into account a perfect foresight. One of the particular thing in order to uh, take into account the, the dynamics of storage and, 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 and also the flexibility that we can take from, from this analysis is that our model takes into account the 8,760 hours. Um, and so we focus in one particular year and as a brownfield setting. And in this case is for Germany. One of the more relevant uh, decision variables that the model provides is, for example, the technology passes, as, as I mentioned, the investment and the, vector, the battery electric vehicles discharge and charging. So we have here some, some characteristics or some constraints associated with, the, with the, our model. We take into account several uh, generating technologies and also uh, three uh, storage technologies that you can see here. Um, I, I would like to highlight here that for coal, as Germany has decided to, um, to re remove the, 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 the coal power plant in, in the next year. So we fix the maximum 
uh, investment could be the, the, the install capacity that today we have in hardcore and ignite. And also for natural gas technology is free. So the model may choose different uh, investment capacities. Finally, before starting the results, I'm gonna, I'm gonna present the, all the scenarios that uh, I developed. Um, for example, we have considered eight different uh, number of battery electric vehicles. So we have considered 40 uh, time series, but then we scale up based on the number of, of, of electric vehicles. In this case, it's zero, one million, three, five, seven, and until 40 million electric vehicles. Uh, we have also considered two different uh, carbon price, 40 uh, euros per ton and 80. And um, we have, an, as I mentioned before, we have considered a connection strategy, three different, inflexible, which is the mirror, smart charging, which is the grid to vehicle, and the smart charging, which is vehicles to grid. Um, finally, we, we bounded uh, based on our power system, based on minimum renewable share, uh, which is 65% and 95%. Uh, in total, we have uh, generated 96 scenarios. And to generate those 96 scenarios, it takes in our computer about uh, three hours. Um, so, Jumping to the results now. Uh, the first, uh, this slide, what I am presenting here, are the, the carbon price, which is 40 here, and the carbon price in 80. In this, in this area, we have the, the constraint associated with the renewable share, which is 65% and 95%. And then we have here in color, the, the, the blue color represents the smart charging, and the red color, the flexible charging. And the, dot, the dash line represents the vehicles to grid uh, configuration. The uh, x axis is the number of uh, electric vehicles that we consider here. And then in the y axis, we have the different metrics that we are going to analyze. Uh, I'm going to present about eight uh, different graphs. So we are going to start with this one. So, uh, as we have mentioned, uh, I, I have mentioned here that the rest share is 65%. We can see, for example, that there are some scenarios, and particularly in the case of um, smart charging vehicles to grid, it, uh, this constraint is not bound. So we can see depends on the number of electric vehicles and also increasing the number of electric vehicles, we are reaching in the power system also, a higher uh, share of renewables until 80% and close to 85% as well. So in this case, when we have the, the carbon price uh, uh, set as 80, so the, the, the renewables reach 90% in the system, which is very, very interesting. And actually, it, it provides uh, some information, useful information on how is the flexibility related on the energy consumption of increasing the fleet of electric vehicles. So um, that's, that's relevant. In this case, when we set 90% uh, of renewable, this constraint is bound, and then it reached in all the cases 90% of renewable. So now I am switching to um, the dot assistant cost. As we can see here, which is interesting, is that um, again, the vehicles to grid configuration in all the options based on carbon prices and renewables have the lowest power system, uh, uh, total system, system cost. But what is very, very interesting is here that, uh, for example, in this case of carbon price of 80 euros per ton, uh, we can see that between uh, 1 million and, and, and also uh, uh, even until 30 million, the cost, the, the total system cost is lower than in a case that we have zero electric vehicles. So what, that, that, that's, that's really interesting. So the flexibility that may provide the vehicles to read is, uh, um, uh, is, is, is really interesting. Um, the other information that we can see is the flexible charging, uh, where the power system cannot make any kind of decision in the charging. Uh, it always le leads to the highest total system cost in all the configurations. The other, the other relevant is the grid to vehicle. It's not that bad, even though the increase of the number of, uh, of the vehicles in the system uh, 
increases, the cost also increases, but uh, in a reasonable um, area. So now I'm going to present the, the emissions, the, the carbon emissions, the million tons. And that is very, very interesting because what we can see here is that, the, first of all, uh, as we have seen, that the vehicles to lead configuration reduces the emission of uh, electric vehicles, which is expected in most of the scenarios because the flexibility that it provides enables increase the renewable share. And we have seen the first uh, graph. But the other interesting thing is that when we increase the cost of the, 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 co the carbon price, so the this, this switch is, is really, really high. Um, so this is a very, very relevant in, in indication. In the case of uh, setting a 95% renewable share, we can see that the, that the emission of CO2 remains lower. But uh, from my point of view, this configuration is bounded uh, the model is forced, and uh, we also we will. I am going to go up again. Uh, no, th this one. The cost of the system uh, is is much higher. I am showing again the cost of the system, and I am comparing the cost of the system of uh, ninety percent renewables, and it's about uh, forty five million in serial electric vehicles and increases. However, here in a sixty five percent, actually the. This is a 70% of renewables, if we look at the, the previous graph. But here, um, we can see this uh, 58 uh, billions of euros. So that's another. One, one more thing, I think we have uh, three minutes now, and I think I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to finish in those three minutes, but then I'm going to try to explain more quickly this part. Those are the investment uh, decision uh, on the power system. But in this case, what we are showing here are the configuration. We are setting in 65% renewable share. Uh, we still have here the cost of the carbon price. But here in this, we have the grid to vehicles and vehicles to grid. One of the interesting thing is that all the configuration increases the, the solar and wind generation. Uh, in a configuration with uh, vehicles to be, the investment is higher for solar and it increases substantially between the zero and 10 million electric vehicles. But the other thing that we can see here, for example, is that the, 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 the configuration of grid to vehicle, the natural gas generation increases, increases while the electric vehicle increases. So we can see also here the decision in storage and here uh, we can see the grid to vehicle, the model decides to invest on lithium ion batteries while the, uh, this investment increases while the number of electric vehicles increases. But in the case of vehicles to grid, we, uh, the system rely on the batteries of electric vehicles and mm, does not invest at all in other storage technology. So the only storage option that remains is the uh, pump idle storage. So going back again with our analysis, I'm going to show this last slide related on, on what is the, the, the emissions as associated from a perspective of an electric vehicle. Um, so we have the grams of CO2 per vehicle per kilometer. And as we can see, the highest value is uh, about 60 uh, grams. Um, and then, but it, I want to, to mention here that the, we have here again, the rest share, 90% and 65%. I am always focusing in this 65% as this uh, restriction is not found. And we reach higher renewable share while the number of electric vehicles increases. So in this case, what I can see, what we can see is that the, the it's interesting that the vehicles to grid, it has very high emission. Uh, when the number of the vehicles are below 20 million. Uh, why, why that happened? So I, I would like to, to compare um, this uh, residual load duration curve and only focus on what are the decision investment. For example, in the case I have 5 million electric vehicles, 65 renewables, uh, the price of carbon is 40. And we can see that the allocation of the charging of the electric vehicle, which is this blue color, is mostly allocated for renewables. And then we avoid this, this purple color, which is the curtainment. So it's avoided. Oh, that, that's fantastic, no? But the other interesting thing is that 
there are some other charging needs because the vehicles have some flexibility, but in some moment they, they don't have flexibility. They need to charge because they, they are, are running out of uh, battery energy in the battery. So in this case, the charging uh, occurs outside the hour of renewable generation, and which provide the, the, the generation here uh, are the fossil fuel technologies, and also as well, this biomass. Now so, so, yeah. So, so to interrupt, you have one or two minutes to conclude maximum. Okay, thank you very much. So the second case is the, the point that I would like to mention here is the point B. The point, the point A was the, the, the one I, I already mentioned, and the, which was the grid to vehicle, and the, the B is the, the vehicles to grid. And here, actually, what we can see is that the, the decision of charging uh, occurs in renewables, but the discharging occurs uh, during the peak times. And also, the charging uh, is very, very high because it needs to charge for provide the energy for the vehicles, but also have need to charge the vehicle to store and then provide back to the system. And that's where we can see again, the, the fossil fuel generation provides electricity. And that's why we can see very high energy. I, I have this one, the last one. And just to provide you, this is the mere charging. As you can see, it's very low. Uh, it's a weak uh, comparison, but we can see the peak usually are in time between uh, in the evening. And however, the grid to vehicle, the charging are mostly low allocated in the solar generation. And in the case of vehicle to grid, it needs to charge more than uh, the energy required. It, the, the charge also follows the solar generation. So in general, the conclusion are that the vehicle to grid uh, in the connection strategy that show the lowest system cost across all the scenarios uh, in settings which are renewables. So um, I think, uh, unfortunately, I, due to the time, I don't know if I have the time to explain those points, but I think we're quite clear during the presentation. Thank you for the wrap up, uh, Carlos. Sorry for, uh, for pushing the, the end of, the, of your presentation to be a, a quite, uh, quite on a hurry, but uh, uh, when we are four in the session, it's always complicated to, to, to stay on time. Uh, is there one or two uh, burning questions for uh, Carlos before we, we, we end up the session? Um, so it's mainly, okay, you, we have one, one question by Philip. So please, Philip. Maybe more a comment because uh, first of all, of all uh, thank you very much, Carlos, for the, for the great uh, presentation. Um, what I noticed is that uh, actually most of our presentations came to similar conclusions also with the potential of uh, EVs uh, to reduce actively the amount of um, investments into stationary batteries and Carlos, I saw it in your presentation as well. This is uh, super interesting and uh, actually shows that we are all basically on the, on the correct way. But uh, then we are also getting incentives to figure out what are the reasons why it's not happening right now. So super cool, Carlos. Thank you. Thank you very much for, for your comment, Philip. And sorry for, for, for finishing the presentation a little late. Thank you very much. Oh, no, no problem. So uh, there is other sessions on vehicle uh, to grid and on electric vehicle during the three days. So I, I think we will uh, we will have other opportunities to, to discuss and compare your works with others. So please stay with us for the three days and uh, we will probably resume in uh, this afternoon. There is other sessions on, on vehicle to grid and uh, all, the, um, all the two days, there is always a session on EVs. So I hope that we, we keep on um, interacting in, in these sessions. So I would like to uh, thank you the whole four and uh, we are going to keep on this discussion on the, over the three days, don't worry, and after, of course. Thank you and uh, see you soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.